Welcome to everyone who is joining us for our second broadcast today. Um, it's an absolute delight to, to have you here with us um, for this introduction to the ISAQB CPSA certification program. Um, let's sort out some of these acronyms perhaps from the start. The ISAQB, the International Software Architecture Qualifications Board, um, also ISAQB, um, and the CPSA is the Certified Professional for Software Architecture. So, um, the agenda for the session this afternoon, um, I'll introduce myself and my co-presenter in a moment. Um, we'd like to talk to you about the CPSA certification programme. In particular, we're going to give you an introduction to the foundation level, including a little bit of information about the exam. Then we'll move on to the advanced level and we'll look at the training courses that are available and also the certification process. We'll do a closing summary, telling you a little bit about perhaps the benefits of the certification to you. And then we're going to open up for some questions. On the right hand side of your screen, you should see a question box. Please pop your questions in there and we'll try to answer them all at the end. Um, if, you're, um, if time is against us and we don't um, answer your question in the session, then we'll certainly follow up. We will record the session and it'll be made available for you to, to dip in and out of and um, recap on some of the things presented and of course share with people who you think would find it valuable. So a little bit about myself, I'm Debbie Archer, I'm Managing Director for ISKI Limited. ISKI are one of the authorised exam providers for the ISAQB and I am so pleased to have with us Mr Roger Rhodes who is a very active member of the ISAQB and also an accredited trainer and I'll leave it to Roger to tell you a little bit more about himself in a moment. As I mentioned ISKI is an official certification body for the ISAQB a little bit about ISKI. Um, we were established in 2004. Our headquarters and our international service centre is in Potsdam, Berlin in Germany. We deliver about 30,000 exams each year across a broad portfolio of certifications, including ISTQB, UXQB, ISAQB. We also have um, other certifications um, in areas such as requirements engineering. We have our office in Potsdam, but also our limited based here in the UK, our Inc based in um, Boston, um, and our BV based in the Netherlands. As a certification body, we deliver the exam. We offer the exam over multiple delivery channels, and I'll give you some insight into those in a moment. We organize the registrations and the invigilation for the exam. We evaluate and we validate. Importantly, ISQI is certificated against ISO 17024, and this is the accreditation for actually certifying individuals. We're also accredited to 9001, so you can be assured of quality and also the security of your data. Our relationship with the board is extremely important. They are the knowledge um, subject matter experts, they develop the syllabuses and the exams. And why would they use a certification body to deliver the exams? Of course, it's for independent validation. I know Roger will touch on this a little bit later also. An important part of the ecosystem is the training providers. And we have training providers around the world. We've listed just some of the countries there. I mentioned exam types and I'll just give you a little bit of insight here because it's often one of the questions we get asked in the chat when we do these webinars. Exams can be done um, as a group after training typically. Exams could be paper or indeed online and we will send an invigilator. Our invigilators by the way are trained and we do actually certify them to, to invigilate. You can also do the exams as an individual after self-study. You can take your exam at a Pearson View Test Centre. And also, at the moment, via remote proctor, so even from home. And at this time, I think it's important that exams are accessible via the remote proctor solution. 
I'm going to pass on to Roger and we can get into the content which is of most interest to you and that is about the scheme itself. So Roger, if I can pass over to you to introduce yourself and then to, to, to share some what I know is very compelling and useful information. Okay, okay, thank you Debbie and in general I'd like to thank um, ISQI as well as ISA QB, um, ISA QB, uh, just for the opportunity that I can uh, present this today. So as Debbie said, I am an active um, Izakube member. I am also an accredited trainer and an accredited training provider. And I currently myself give the following trainings with foundation level and then the advanced level soft skills and enterprise architecture management. And at Albion Academy, we do offer other Izakube trainings as well, like functional architecture, architecture documentation, et cetera. In addition, obviously, in addition to Izuku Bay, I do do other trainings uh, with Enterprise Architecture Management, Togaf, and a few others. I think one of the things that sets me apart as a trainer, as well as Albion Academy, is that our trainings are very highly interactive. It is very unusual for me to show slides, as in uh, as I am doing in this webinar. Um, it is very unusual. I usually use flip charts. We have then exercises and case studies and that kind of thing. And uh, so it's uh, it's always I've always gotten good feedback because it's so highly interactive. And the other thing that I do, I am a practicing software and enterprise architect, and I bring this practical experience into the courses as well. I think it's very important that the participants not only learn the theory, but also learn what actually works in practice. So, so I won't say anything more about myself. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Albion Academy or what courses we offer, simply go to albion.eu and all, all the information is listed there. So I'd like to start off today simply about what is the International Software Architecture Qual Qualification Board, ESA-QB. So what we are not is actually a, a course provider. What we are is an independent nonprofit organization. And one thing I'd like to stress here is this picture on this page, because that is us. That That is the, um, not everyone, but a large part of who we are. And we are volunteers. And so that means what we do is we do everything in our free time. So everything we've accomplished so far in the last years with Izuku Bay, most of us have done that in our free time. And we do that just simply out of the love of software architecture. And it's, uh, I think that means a lot because it's not someone who's just trying to make money, but it's someone who's just trying to promote software architecture in general. The Easy Bay started almost 20 years ago now as the German Software Architecture Board. So in this, the very next year, they already had their first certified architects. And then in 2008, they became independent as a, and founded the association and are now the International Software Architecture Qualification Board. Since that time, we've now have 17,000 certified software architects worldwide. In the starting years, it was concentrated in the so-called Dach um, region, the, German, the uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. But we've since expanded. Now we're, for example, I'm giving a course in Ukraine in October. Uh, there are There is a training provider in Vietnam, and there will soon be training providers in India as well as in China. So, but what do we do? <laughs> what, what are our goals? What do we do at, all, at, at Izuku Bay? So one of the main things we do is just simply develop and maintain the curricula for both the foundation as well as the different advanced software architecture courses. We also define and oversee the certification process and examinations together with the certification bodies like ISQE. And we do accredit the courses themselves, the training providers, and the trainers. So, and the last thing is since the very beginning is to standardize and raise awareness of software architecture in general. And to that, we're starting this year, it hasn't started yet, but we're starting this year architecture communities so that we don't just provide curriculum for, for trainings, but we have a community. 
So everyone who's been certified at either the foundation and or the, the advanced level can become part of our alumni community and we can exchange information, get new contacts as software architects in, under, in other industries and in other countries and just simply start building a software architecture community. So, but we can't do this alone. Um, Izuku Bay, as I said, defines and oversees the curricula, the exams, and accreditates the training providers. The training providers then sell, market, and organize the trainings themselves. So if you want to book a course for an, an Izuku Bay software architecture course, you go to the training provider. Again, Izuku Bay doesn't offer the courses themselves, but we define the curricula for the courses that are then offered by the training providers. Now the training providers need trainers. And so they are a separate entity. The trainers can either work for the training providers themselves, or like myself, I'm an independent trainer that also works for several other training providers. And the trainers then pre prepare the training material, they perform the trainings, and they do everything that's, that's within the training itself. So now once you've taken the training, you wanna get certified. And that's what companies like Izuku E, uh, ISQI are for. Um, they are called certification bodies and they organize the different exams and the certification, both at the foundation and at the, at the advanced level. Now, one of the things I like about this is that there's a separation of concerns. In software architecture, there's an architecture principle called separation of concerns. And here it makes sense as well. For example, you've got your trainers, and your certification bodies. Now, if the trainers were to provide the exams, there would be a conflict of interest there. And so we separate that between the trainers and the certification bodies and the training providers. And last but not least are the academic partner. The academic, academic partners are similar to the training providers. They prepare students for the, for the exam. They organize along with the certification bodies, the different exams, um, but they're more on the academic side and the training providers are more on the uh, commercial side. So now let's get down to the certification program itself. We're talking about the foundation and the advanced level certifications. So as I just mentioned, there are two types of certifications at the moment. There's the foundation level, which is there to show that you have the knowledge to create, document, and evaluate architectures for small to medium-sized systems. And then there's the advanced certification, which is there to verify that you actually have the skills to create architectures for not just small and medium-sized systems, but also large mission-critical systems. So the foundation level is there to show, I know what I'm doing, I'm familiar with software architecture. And the certification test then shows that you can, that you can show that you have this knowledge. The advanced level shows that you can not only have this knowledge, that you not only have this knowledge, but you also can apply that knowledge. So we'll talk about how that's done later. Now there are other certifications that are in the works. There's one at an expert level is pretty close to being completed and it should be completed either this year or started next year. And the expert level is above the advanced level. And so the expert level is for people who show not only do they have the knowledge, not only do they have the skills and can apply that knowledge, but they can also expand the software architecture to topics. And so again, uh, that'll be coming sometime this year or early next year. So, and there are other talks of different types of certifications in the future, but these are the ones, the main ones that, that we have so far. So we've talked about the certifications. Uh, let's talk specifically now about the foundation course content. So the foundation is the first level and it starts with the basic concept of software architecture. What are the terms and definitions, et cetera? Then the largest part is, as it should be, design and development. And it's how do we design an architecture? How do we develop the architecture? And the next step of, of the foundation then is specification and communication. So it doesn't do you much good if you've designed this great architecture, but you're not able to communicate it to your stakeholders and meet their needs. And so as we see here in this graphic, specification and communication is a large part of the foundation level topics. 
So the next part is software architecture and quality. And what's meant with quality are the quality attributes of a system, for example, uh, maintainability, reliability, security, et cetera. And so this section is talking about what are the quality requirements and how do we meet those with software architecture. And the last point is examples. And that's simply a set of examples that the trainer provi provides to the, to the participants to show them from specific projects, from actual real projects, what are example of deliverables that are used in software architecture. We'll go a level deeper here with the description. These are the same topics from the last slide, but just a, uh, one step deeper, one, one, one step more in detail. In, in, in detail. And the basic concepts, again, terms, definitions, what are the benefits of architecture? What do we do as architects at all? What kind of, what kind of tasks do we have? What kind of IT systems are there and how are they different and, and how are they present different challenges for architecture? Then design and development. And again, this is the largest part of the foundation course. Uh, what design approaches can we use? Top down, bottom up, domain driven design, et cetera. What design principles can we use? What design principles can we create? Uh, what design patterns can we use? Are there, are there solutions that are already out there that would help us to design our architecture? And then so-called cross-cutting concerns, things like monitoring, uh, security, uh, logging, those kind of topics that, that cut across the entire system. And then how do we define our interfaces? How do we define the structure of our architecture? All of these things are covered in that area. And the last thing in this area is architecture decisions. How do we make the architecture decisions? What decisions do we make? What decisions are we responsible for? How do we document the decisions? And then again, we need to communicate our design. The design doesn't do much good if we're not able to communicate it. So we talk about stakeholders, the types of stakeholders that we commonly deal with, their needs, how do we communicate them? What kind of documentation do we create? Uh, So-called views, different perspectives on the architecture that you can document and document templates and that kind of thing. And again, the last thing is the architecture quality, different quality models for defining security, reliability, maintainability, et cetera. And then in the end, what we're trying to achieve is how do we meet those requirements? And so we also talk about architecture evaluation and how, and how do we assess an architecture so that we can show that it meets those quality attributes. So before we talked about what's in the foundation level course, and now let's talk about what's not in the foundation level course, because it's, it's important to, to uh, handle misconceptions. So the things inside the circle, that's the things we've already talked about, the things that are covered in the foundation course. What we don't cover in the foundation course is the implementation technologies. Those are mostly covered in the advanced modules. And so very, very specific technologies, for example, to create microservices, those will be covered in the microservices advanced course. The next three points, frameworks, libraries, software tools, programming and programming languages, those are typically also covered partially in the advanced modules and partially not at all. If you can imagine, we have all kinds of different participants in our classes. Some may be using C Sharp, some may be using Java, some may be using PHP, and PHP, and they all are using different frameworks and libraries and tools. And so we can't cover all of them. So again, in some of the advanced courses, some of these tools will be covered in some of the programming languages when they're specific to that topic, um, but those are somewhat outside of the scope of, of the courses. The next thing is modeling and modeling notation, such as UML. We do touch on this a little bit in the foundation course with specification and communication. How do you model your architecture? But it's a topic all for itself. And so we are working on a, an advanced level module for modeling your software architecture. And the last three points are definitely outside of the scope of the foundation course and partially out of the scope for, for software architecture in general. So one of them is software testing, and this is covered by the International Software Test Qualification Board, for example. 
requirements engineering covered by the International Requirements Engineering Board, and project or product management covered by a variety of different certifications, such as the, the PRINCE, project management, professional, et cetera. So those are definitely out of the scope for the software architecture. So, so far we've covered then the foundation course, and now we're moving on to the advanced level courses. So these are the current advanced level courses. There are 16 courses. In the middle of this matrix, you'll see the foundation course grayed out and all of the covered, colored uh, hexagons, those are then the advanced level courses. So there are more coming. We are working on others, but these are the current ones that have already been published. Now, these are the abbreviations. You'll see things like DDD for Domain Driven Design, REC for ARC, which is the requirements for architecture, Agila is the um, Agile Architecture and Architecture Evaluation, et cetera. We'll see what they stand for on the next slide. Now, in order to get the advanced level certif certification, you're required to get a total of 70 credit points. So unlike the foundation certification for the advanced level certification, the, the courses are required. And every course is assigned between 10 and 30 credit points. And you need a total of 70 credit points in order to take the certification, which typically means you need to take about three courses. I have had some, some participants that have four, five, six courses, um, but in general, you can cover the 70 points with three courses. And each one of these courses will be then assigned a certain number of credit points in each of these three different areas technological, communication, and methodological. And some of these, for example, web is mostly based on technologies, soft is mostly based on communication, enterprise architecture management is mostly based on methodologies. Then there are some that are mixed, for example, domain-driven design, partially communication, partially method methodology. Um, SWAM is for mobile, and mobile is, is mostly technology and partially methodology. And so this gives you a pretty good overview about which courses get which credit points. So on this slide, it's the exact same information, but with the module names. And so for each abbreviation, you can see what module name it is. I won't through, read through the list. Um, if you want more information on this list, simply go to the Izakube website. Again, that's um, isaqb.org, and all of these advanced level courses are listed, and there's a curriculum for every one of these courses. And there's also information about how many credit points each one of these courses are worth. So now we've talked about the content of the foundation and the advanced courses, and now we'll talk about the exams and, and the examination process, the certification process. We'll start off with the certification exam. The certification exam has a total of 64 points, and each question in the certification, it's a multiple choice question uh, test, each question in the multiple choice test is rated from one to three points. So I can't tell you how many questions are in the test because in the first place, the questions have a different number of points. And in the second place, the questions are randomized. So one test taker will have one set of questions and another test taker will have another set of questions, but they always total to a total of 64 points. So which means it's usually about 40 questions, give or take one, or, one to three questions or so. In order to pass the exam, you need a minimum percentage of 60%. It doesn't sound like much, but the exam is actually a very difficult exam. And so 60% for some people is already pretty difficult. It is a time test. And so you get 75 minutes for the test. However, if your native language is not the language of the test, so for example, I took um, a, a German test and my native language is English. And so I was allowed an extra 20 minutes. So the, court, the, the, the exams are currently offered in German and in English, and there will be additional languages coming soon. We're definitely talking that till the end of this year, we'll have the, the exam in Portuguese, French, Italian, and Spanish, and we're working on others as well. On the test, there are three types of questions. The first type of question is a single choice test, uh, sorry, a single choice question. 
And this is an example of just from the following four possibilities, choose one and only one correct answer. The second type is a multiple choice question. And in this case, in, in this uh, example, it's from the following four, uh, excuse me, from the following four possibilities, choose two and only two uh, correct answers. Now, it may be two correct answers, it may be three correct answers or four correct answers, but it's always a specific number of correct answers. And the last one is particularly difficult. It's called the clarification question. In this case, you're given a number of possibilities, in this case, four. And for each one of these possibilities, you need to make a choice. In this case, if it's true or false. So for every single possibility, you need to make a choice. Is it true or is it false? Now, it's not always true or false. It could be less than or greater than, or it could be this is a developer activity and this is a software architect activity. It could be a number of different things, but it's always a choice between two things. And for every possibility, you need to, you need to make a choice. And so that's, that's a particularly difficult question. That's one of the things that makes this, this exam a little bit harder. So we'll talk about the certification process itself from going from the foundation level to the, to the advanced level. In order to get the certification, the foundation certification, you need to take the multiple choice test. And once you've passed the test, you receive the certification. Now the foundation level training is not required. However, it is definitely, um, definitely suggested that you take it. Uh, because the foundation level does obviously impart knowledge about uh, foundation level software architecture topics, but it also helps you prepare for the exam. So once you've got the foundation certification, then you can move on to the advanced level certification. Now the prerequisites for that, as I said before, are these different training courses. So you need a total of 70 credit points in the three different competency areas. Now, once you've done that, then you'll receive a case study, and I'll go a little bit more into that on the next slide, but to receive a case study, once you've completed the case study, then you receive the, the certification for the advanced level. So this is the certification process just for the advanced level. So again, the prerequisite is the foundation level certification. And then you'll go and receive your points by taking the, the different courses that are the, the different advanced level courses. And then you go through and you'll send in your resume to show that you've got software architecture experience. You'll set a date for when you want to complete your case study. And then there's a number of formal activities you need to complete with confidentiality agreements, et cetera. The fees for the certification are in Germany at least 1,700 euro, but they do differ from between the certification bodies as well as in different countries. So you'll need to talk to the certification body about exactly how much it would cost in your country. So once all the formal activities are completed, you'll receive a case study. The case study is typically between 10 and 20 pages long, and you can think of it as a, a project description. And so you receive this project description and your task then is to design an architecture that meets the requirements described in this case study. So your results will be between 30 and 40 pages and there are a number of requirements, there are a number of activities, specific tasks that need to be completed in this case study that are listed in the case study itself. And once you've completed all that and once you've designed your architecture for this project, then it'll be passed on to the reviewers. And the reviewers will then uh, uh, review your case, your, your answer to your case study, so the architecture for your case study, and they will then assess it and give you uh, the results back. And once you've then accomplished that part, then you go into what's called a defense, which is basically a conversation between the reviewers and the candidate and the reviewers will ask several questions as to why you made certain uh, certain decisions, architecture decisions in the in the case study. Um, why did you use this architecture principle instead of this architecture principle? Um, which arch which uh, design patterns fit 
uh, the best to your to your case study. And so it's a uh, it's to clarify some questions that may have occurred when the reviewers reviewed your document, as well as to get information with from you personally in a in a I would say face to face, but in generally it's done over the phone or in a video conference then. And once all that's completed and everyone agrees that the the two reviewers agree that the all the requirements for the case study are met, and then you receive your advanced certification. So in closing, you may be asking yourself, seems like a, a lot of work. Why would I even get these certifications? It seems like a lot of work. Well, there are a lot of advantages to these certifications. In the first place, you are better qualified to advance your career. You have new skills and you have proof of your qualifications. The second as an employee is that you just simply improve your skills and you have a certain task to do in your job <laughs> and you need certain skills to do these tasks. And these courses and these certifications help you to, to get the skills that you need to do your job. And in the end, once you do your job better, you'll also have a better job satisfaction. And from an employee perspective, one of the things I think is very important is it just simply helps improve communication and collaboration. So for example, if I'm working with another architect and I start talking about microservices this or blockchain that, then both parties will know what we're talking about if they've taken the same courses and the same certification. And so it really improves your efficiency and your communication and collaboration with your colleagues. Now that's from the employee perspective. What about from the employer's perspective? What happens if you have multiple employees and you want to train them? What is the advantage of these certifications? Well, in the first place, you simply keep ahead of the competition. Your employees will learn the new technologies and methodologies, and these are things that you need to remain competitive. As I stated, there are, there are uh, uh, advanced level modules for blockchain, for cloud infrastructure, for agile architecture, for mobile, et cetera. And so this helps you then stay ahead of the competition. And the other thing is just to simply recruit and retain great employees. If you've got employees, one of the things you can tell them is as, a, as an advantage to, to your company, you can, you can train them and you can certify them as software architects. And that will increase also their motivation and their satisfaction. For potential employees, you can show that you regularly train your employees and that you have a lot of uh, certified software architects that your potential employees can work with. And that also motivates them to, to get hired by you. And the last thing, which I think is the most important, is just to simply succeed at what you're doing. Today, every company is an IT company and or at least has partially IT and, and there's a lot of IT that needs to be done just to simply get things done nowadays and so most companies will have large IT initiatives in order to move themselves forward in order to 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 implement their business strategies and if your people are trained in the right technologies the right methodologies you have a much much higher success rate for your architecture initiatives So in summary, we've talked about how EasyCube is an independent volunteer-led organization that promotes software architecture through standardized curriculum. The EasyCube certifi certification program includes both the foundation level, which tests your knowledge, and the advanced level, which verifies that you can apply that knowledge. The foundation certification is based on a multiple choice test and the advanced certification on a practice-based case study. And the EasyCube CPSA certifications enable both employees and employers to simply be more successful in whatever they do. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and we'll move on to questions. Thank you so much, Roger. As I said in my introduction, um, such compelling information. I think my takeaway is that CPSA offers 
a breadth of knowledge, a really important breadth of knowledge, as well as um, being able to uh, verify a depth of knowledge and help people develop that depth of knowledge and specialism. So thank you so very much for that. Um, we'll move on to some questions, Roger, if that's okay with you. Um, a question, first of all, about the foundation course length. Um, what's the, how come some training providers are offering three days and others are offering four days? Uh, partially, that's just simply a matter of what's what's requested from the customer. So I do have customers myself, for example, that say they don't want to let their employees go for more than three three days because they don't have the time. And so we can perform that in three days. I personally prefer giving the four-day course because it gives the class participants much more time to do uh, case studies, exercises, and things like that. Because I've learned that, that the... Um, that the participants learn a lot more when they can actually work hands-on. And so there's more time, there's an extra day time to do those kind of exercises in a four-day class. But in a three and four-day classes, typically then you'll, or not typically, in, in both the three and the four-day classes, you will definitely cover all of the foundation level um, topics. But the four-day course has a little bit more time, so you're not so rushed, has some more time for hands-on exercises, and in general, then um, uh, gives you a lot better feel about what software architecture is and how you perform it. Thank you, Roger. Um, I have someone here who's saying, I would like to self-study. So can you recommend some self-study material? And also, are there any mock questions available? Mock, is there a mock exam available? Mm -hmm. um, so for the first question is the self-study guide. We don't have self-study guides per se, but there is a, a book that you can just simply buy on Amazon or anywhere else called the Software Architecture Fundamentals, a study guide for the certified professional for software architecture. Um, this book is written by Mabubo Garvey, Arne Kolschel, and Andreas Rausch. And it definitely covers uh, all of the foundation level topics. So if, you, if you've if you chosen this book, then you should be able to uh, be fairly well prepared for the, for the exam. Um, for a mock exam, uh, we are working on that with something we've known about. Again, we do this, we do our work in our free time. <laughs> and so sometimes it's hard to find free time, uh, but we have put an emphasis on this in this last year. And so we're, we're getting pretty close to completing. The last I uh, um, understood is that should be June, July, we should have mock exams available, um, but I need to confirm that with my colleagues. But it definitely should be this year that we'll have mock exams made available for the exam. That's great. Um, my colleague has very kindly just given me the ISBN number for the book. So that is ISBN 13-978-386-4906-251. And um, I'm sure we'll be able to publish that somewhere so people can actually um, look it up and follow on from that. Um, interesting question here. Um, Roger mentioned separation of concern. Um, why is that important? Um, perhaps as a certification body, um, I might just chip in a little bit here. I mentioned the ISO standard 17024, and that's an incredibly important standard for certification bodies such as ISQI. And we kind of live and die by that, really, because that is the assurance that there is a separation of concern, meaning that the training providers are not giving a, perhaps um, a, what could be questioned as a biased view of somebody's actual um, capability. Um, the, the exam is validated independently by ISQI, and um, there's a complete separation between training provider, ISQI, and indeed ISAQB, other than ISAQB will that define um, the exams and also the marking guidelines. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, Roger, is there anything else you, you might add to that? Um, uh, no, it, it gives us some more flexibility as well. If you're separating, the, for example, with the training providers and the trainers, you have um, that not all trainers need to be by a specific training provider, but a training provider can con, um, can contract multiple trainers, for example. Um, and as you said, as a, as a training provider myself, I know it's um, uh, there's that certain conflict of interest that I mentioned before is you don't want a 
you don't want a training provider also giving the exam because he's motivated that his people do well on the exam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, question here. Um, I'm a developer and I'm interested in moving into software architecture. What recommendation would you give me? Um, take the certification and ask for a raise. <laughs> so, um, now, if you're already a developer, 90% of my 90% of my um, of my participants in my foundation course are developers and they're not architects yet. So that's obviously one of the first one of the first things you can do is just simply um, um, come to the course. You'll learn a lot about about how it's done. Take the exam, and and then if you've already passed that, the individual focus areas of these of these advanced level modules are very helpful. So for example, if you're working on mobile applications, there's a specific there's a specific uh, advanced level module for that. So uh, personally as a developer, that's definitely where I would start. I I pick up the book that we mentioned, uh, take the course, take the exam and then move on from there. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Roger. Um, I'm just going to ask if anybody has any more questions, if you want to pop them in the box now and Roger can can address them. Um, I, maybe this might be the final one, Roger, um, but what would you say would be the prerequisites for somebody moving into that architecture role? So not necessarily from the taking the exam point of view, but what other sort of skills would you, you would anticipate would be useful? You know, we talk about this in the foundation course as well, is that there are hard skills that you need, obviously. Um, for example, you should have developed systems because you don't want to work in the so-called ivory tower and not know how to develop it. So you, you should have some development experience. Um, but there's also the soft skills side as well, is a, a software architect has to communicate a lot. And so communication skills are important. So to also take some courses on, on soft skills, for example, or, or to have them yourself. Um, uh, also, uh, communication leads sometimes to conflict and things. And so you need to have some of that as well. But a, 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 another difference is that a developer is typically very focused on specific technologies and a software architect is more of a jack of all trades. He knows he needs to know a little about a lot of things. So that's one of the other things that you can do as a developer is simply um, um, get out of the details and get more into the overview of the system. Roger, I think that's a really lovely um, question to, to, to end on. Thank you to you from all of us at ISKI and uh, a big thank you to everybody who's attended. Um, I'll close off now by saying um, take care all and um, hopefully you'll join us again soon for another ISQI webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.